Let's talk about lettering. One of Comics' current great letterers had a small piece in one of his newsletters about the idea that lettering should be invisible, which is a phrase that you've probably heard before. Aditya Bidikar, whose name I'll probably never be able to pronounce correctly, letters books like Black Cloud and Drifter and Motor Crush and many, many others. And he talked in his newsletter a lot about why that saying, lettering should be invisible, why it isn't the case, or why it shouldn't be the case. The main crux of the argument was that lettering, like penciling and inking and colouring, it's built upon making a series of artistic choices. Sometimes those choices mean allowing a reader to flow naturally through a page, like Clayton Cowles mentions in issue 2 of Panel by Panel magazine when discussing house styles in Marvel and DC Comics, but sometimes lettering choices are about being bold and brash, and making readers aware of what's happening with them. I've done an episode before on Sandman's balloons, and how very specifically Todd Klein was working to make you very, very aware of the way he was lettering that book, and for good reason. Ultimately, there's a conscious decision behind all of that. So I wanted to talk this week about Asteria's Polyp by David Mazzuchelli, which is a brilliant piece of cartooning. But one thing that always stands apart for me in this book is what Mazzuchelli does with the lettering. It imbues the book with so much extra character, information, and also some fun. So we'll take a look at what he's doing, why I feel like he's doing it, and what the effect ends up being for the reader. You're watching Strip Panel Naked, I'm Hass, and I'm going to show you some of the cool stuff lurking in the pages of some of the best comics. So the main character in Asterius Polyp is Asterius Polyp himself, a sort of failed architect. As such, all his dialogue balloons are very formal, hard-edged, they're in boxes. No one else in the book has balloons like this, and in fact every single character has their own type of balloon style. But why the hard edges for Polyp? They certainly do end up drawing attention to themselves, and Mazzuchelli invites you to notice everyone's balloons. As with the Sandman example mentioned earlier, word balloons are our way of understanding how these people speak. And often that's a big indicator into who a person is, or at least who a person wants to present themselves as. You can do a lot of this through dialogue too, but you're going to be leaving a potential storytelling tool off the page if you don't want to work the balloons into the story either. Obviously that's not for every story, but Asterius Polyp is so much about character that it feels brilliantly executed and perfectly placed. So with Asterius himself, he's a man who loves and understands architecture, and he comes at life in a very direct and controlled way. His balloons seem to reflect that. There's a lack of personality in them almost, a very stoic look and a feel to the hard lines and hard edges that imbues them with a sense of not messing around. And when you look at that, it gives a sense of character to Asterius when compared to other balloons used. For example, here's Hannah, a love interest for Asterius, another lecturer at the school he teaches at. This is the scene where they first meet, and the differences in their balloon types is very, very noticeable. For Hannah, the balloon is much more fluid and spherical, the tail quite wide and short. Whereas Polyp has full uppercase characters, Hannah has lowercase. There's a softness, a lack of formality, a simpler feel to Hannah's balloons and wording. Obviously, this is all by design, because the word balloons and text are working to give us insight into these people on the page. They're not there purely as a way to deliver their dialogue, but as a way to show how they're delivering their dialogue. Because these two balloons, and with these two bits of text, they feel different, right? They invite different responses from us, or at the very least, they can be asking us to think about why they're being done differently. Which links back to the article I mentioned at the top of the episode by Bidikar, in which he says lettering is an artistic choice like any other in the medium, in that the design and style and layout is a specific choice from someone involved in the storytelling process, and so Mazzuchelli lettering this himself is making the conscious choice to create different looking balloons for these characters. It also functions as a way to alienate characters for certain moments. Asteria spends most of the book being naturally alienated because of the way he is, or at least the way he seems himself, and the straight edge balloons are a constant reminder that he never lets that up. This person is different. A few pages after Asterius and Hannah meet here for the first time, we get a sort of flashback to Hannah's home life and her interactions with her parents, and that also gives us a bit more explanation. Because firstly, this moment is great for the way Hannah's soft balloons and lowercase texts start to now feel quite childish compared to the uppercase jaggedy edges of her parents. So now we're getting this understanding of Hannah as maybe a purer soul. Even when we see her scale up in age, her balloon and font stay the same. So to me, it feels like it keeps this sense of childishness. We're starting to understand a little more of what the balloons say about people, and it's coming across specifically because of the way the balloons are designed, rather than the content of them in the form of dialogue. And in that scene, we see her parents' balloon is uppercase words, a harsher, darker font, and jagged edges. It's very reminiscent of Asterius's balloons, actually both in design and in font style, which naturally starts to link it and give us further a sense of understanding for both Hannah and Asterius himself. Here's a girl who is constantly trying to impress and make her parents proud, to be overshadowed by someone else's achievements, it's literally overlaid over her balloons in the sequence, and yet coming back for more. Her interactions with Asterius are very, very similar, the sense of trying to impress and prove her worth. But now we've seen this sequence, we'll always be brought back to this moment of understanding. So the question maybe is why, you know, why do this? 
And there's no doubt that lettering choices, if noticed, might take you out of the flow of reading the story. You might stop and consider the significance, you might even step away to think about it more. But this is only a bad thing if we assume that the purpose of all story is to be subsumed in it. The playwright Bertolt Brecht had the concept of epic theatre, which argued just the opposite. He was intentionally after an alienation of the audience from the story, hoping it would cause reflection and self-reflection. Nothing about Polyp's plot is traditional, it doesn't have much momentum almost. It's a story about the self and self-reflection and about making things. And I think you can make an argument that Mazzuccelli is intentionally pushing you out of the story, hoping you'll think about why he's doing what he's doing, and what it might mean both in the context of his work and in the greater context of making things. And again, this is down to the lettering not being invisible. In much the same way that art on the page is not invisible, the lettering isn't a separate thing just stuck on top, but it's actually forming part of the art itself. It's working to further the art, and the art is working to further the letters and balloons. In a sense, you know, you can't separate these things from each other anymore. As Bidikar says in his piece, quote, they're not afraid to cover up their own work or to screw with it because the lettering is also art. They design the page around it and they consider it integral, not an addendum. Here, Mazzuccelli's work in the Asterius Polyp is the perfect representation of that. Each stage of this, the line work, the colours, the letters, is truly part of the overall art. I don't think people should be afraid of lettering that asks questions of the reader or presents them something different or new, but realise that actually even down to the thickness of the lines of the balloon, the shape of the balloon, the type of font used in the balloon, all of these are tools that can be manipulated and played with to add so much more to your storytelling on the page. Thanks for watching. Strip Panel Naked continues to be supported by the amazing patrons at patreon.com slash stripppanelnaked. For their pledge, they get tons and tons of extra content updated every single week. I'd love for you to check it out and maybe consider supporting. For more comics talk and analysis, you can find me on Twitter at HassanOE. And finally, hit subscribe and that notification button to keep up to date with all the latest episodes, and we'll see you next time.